So this is ECE 343, Signals and Systems. This will be the third part of Chapter 2. In the previous parts of Chapter 2, we discussed the solution to constant coefficient linear difference equations, at least the first part of it. We looked at something called the zero input response. Today, we're going to be focusing our, our efforts on understanding the zero state response, which we learned last time was computed through something called convolution. I'd like to go ahead and kind of review the derivation that got us to that point. So last time, we looked at this idea that a linear time invariant continuous system described by a constant coefficient linear differential equation, we can do that as q dy of t equaling p dx of t, um, can be looked at from an input-output standpoint um, as follows. We looked at the input x of t, right, and we expressed it using the sifting property as a sum of scaled and shifted delta functions. We went ahead and fed that input into a system that was assumed to be in zero state, and that generated the zero state output, right? Y zero state. That is just the system H acting on the input, which I've represented using that sifting property as a sum of scaled and shifted delta functions. If I apply the linearity property, which this um, linear time invariant continuous system has, um, we can interchange the order of the system with summing and scaling. That allows us to bring the h past the integral and past that scale factor x of tau. Um, that results in this second expression that the zero state response is equal to an integral of x of tau h acting on a shifted delta function. We then invoke the time invariant property and that allows us to interchange the order of delay and system as it's written on top. We have the delay first followed by the system. If I interchange that order, I'm going to do the system first. Um, so a delta going through the system gives me the unit impulse response, little h, and then I'm going to delay it. So I get h of t minus tau. That gives us this final expression, which is a way of relating the zero state response y of t in terms of the input x of t and this quantity h of t, the unit impulse response. This particular equation is known as the convolution integral, right? And the h there is just what is called a unit impulse response. And we can show that, or at least think about that pictorially, as when we whack our system with a delta function, what comes out is the response to that impulsive input, this thing called the h of t. Furthermore, last time, uh, we did take a look at what the closed form uh, form or solution to that unit impulse response was, um, at least for those systems described by constant coefficient linear differential equations. And that was this idea that the unit impulse response could potentially have a delta-like um, component. Um, there are possibilities that the system has sort of wire-like characteristics, and so a delta on the input should be able to come out as a delta on the output. That's dependent on whether the differential equation's coefficient b0 is non-zero or not. And then, um, just like we would expect when you stuff energy into a system and, and step back and see what happens, the rest of the response depends on the natural modes, which can be expressed using the zero input response. And so the particular form for it is PD acting on Y tilde ZIR, um, all made causal U of T because we were looking at an input that only occurs at zero. It couldn't have had any output prior to that. It's a causal system. We found that y tilde zir, right, that is necessary for finding this very particular output, this h of t, using some special initial conditions. We didn't derive these. They are derived in the book, um, but they're easy to remember. Basically, all the initial conditions, the standard initial conditions that we need, y tilde at 0 all the way up through the n minus tooth derivative of y tilde zir at 0. All of those are equal to 0. It's just the highest order derivative initial condition, y tilde of n minus 1 derivative zir. Zir at zero is equal to one. So if you use those special initial conditions, you can find the y tilde zir. You can plug that into this expression for h of t and get h of t. Once you have h of t, you should be able to find the zero state response for any input through the convolution integral. So in a quick summary, uh, we took a look at an input, right, x of t, and we represented it as a sum of scaled and shifted delta functions. We applied that to a linear time invariant system, and we found that the output, which is the zero state response, right, was equal to a sum of scaled and shifted responses to delta. Pretty simple or pretty intuitive type of result. So what are we going to be doing in this lecture? We're really going to turn our attention to evaluating this convolution integral. We have an expression, and it's a nice compact expression, that tells us how to get an output given an input as long as we know one bit of information about the system. What is its unit impulse response? 
if we know that unit impulse response and we know the input, we should be able to, at least in theory, determine the output. That convolution integral itself, though, can be a little tricky to evaluate in some cases. And so we'd like to establish a process or a procedure and certainly do some examples where we can see um, how we can go about mechanically um, evaluating out that convolution integral. It's made probably um, a little bit tricky just because the types of things that we're integrating, the X's and the H's, are piecewise constructed functions, and that piecewise construction of the functions can make that integration a little bit, uh, a little bit messy. So to help illustrate how we might go ahead and evaluate this um, convolution integral, um, we're going to start with a very simple um, electric circuit, a first order electric circuit, and one that you should have seen before and one that you should have some intuition about its behavior. And so here's the question we're going to ask. We're going to ask, what is the step response of the following simple first order, okay, zero state circuit? By saying it's a zero state circuit, we're just saying that that capacitor that's shown in there is not initially charged. It comes um, just discharged. So we take a resistor out of a bin, we take a capacitor out of a bin, we plug them into a circuit and apply a voltage source to it. We monitor the voltage on the capacitor and we're going to call that the output. The step response means what? If we're going to start thinking about this, we can look at it in a kind of directed arrow or a block notation, right? We know that there's an input x and it's going to generate an output y of t. The step response says what? If x of t was the unit step, right? So that's like putting on a battery with one volt. What comes out of it? y of t, right, is going to be h acting on that unit step input. And sometimes we just call that s of t just because it's a pretty common uh, kind of um, quantity to be looking at. So S just standing for the step response. So a special case of the output. All right, so um, we would like to be able to try to figure out the step response to this. I think that um, our intuition can give us an idea of what this should look like. So let's do a, a little bit of intuition on this circuit, just so we can get an idea of where we're going. I picked a circuit that we should all be able to visualize in a pretty complete way. And that way, when we go through the mathematics on it, we can check our math against our intuition and see if that math is, is holding true. So if I take a look at this unit input, right, on um, this unit step input, we know what that looks like. I'm going to go ahead and draw my axis in here. I'm going to go ahead and put my uh, vertical axis as being the signal x of t, horizontal axis as being time, right? And we're going to go ahead and, and think about what that input looks like. In this particular case, right, it's a unit step. So this guy is going to be 0 before time equaling 0. And then it's going to go to a value 1 instantaneous uh, at time t equaling 0 and all times um, forward of that. So all times that are non-negative are going to have a value of 1. We're putting that voltage into this circuit. And so if you think about that, we have a driving circuit up here, right? A driving voltage. It comes in there and it's a hard, it's a hard push to 1 volt, right? That voltage pushes its way around through the circuit and it's trying to get to that capacitor. We know that that capacitor should start charging, right? That capacitor should start charging according to that input voltage. And it should charge towards Towards the input voltage itself. Because capacitors are going to resist an instantaneous change in voltage, we can see that through the ideal differential equation model for a capacitor, we know it's going to take a little bit of time. So everybody back in circuit should have seen this idea that that capacitor should take a little bit of time, but it should charge towards right a value of 1. So we do know in, in a kind of an intuitive way, right, what is the step response, what is the output for this guy y of t as a function of time as to what it should look like. It should be zero before zero because it's a causal system and then it should be a charging kind of nature where it's charging up to a value of one right how fast it charges depends on the values of r and c we don't have to get too hung up or too worried about it at this point so we do have an idea of what this thing looks like. We just want to be able to get the math so we can get a mathematical description of this input-output behavior. We know that convolution can help us, right? Convolution tells us what? It tells us that that zero-state response, right, y, we'll call it in this case the step response, is going to be equal to an integral minus infinity to infinity of our input x of tau, and then we're going to have the h of t minus tau d tau. That's just the convolution integral. For us to be able to do this one though, right? What do we need? I need to get that impulse response function. So before I can go anywhere with this particular system, before I can figure out what its step response is, I'm going to have to find its unit impulse response. I think that we can also 
think about the unit impulse response of this circuit in a very intuitive way as well. So let's go back and take a look at the circuit, right? And I'm going to do this in red now in this particular case. Let's consider a different input, right? One that is impulsive, right? So I'm going to go ahead and think of an input here that's that hammer function, that, that delta function coming in. So I have a voltage, right, that is zero everywhere, but at zero in comes this delta function, this whacking hammer. What does that thing do? It stuffs energy into the system. This particular circuit we said was at zero state, so the capacitor came initially discharged, but that delta function comes in there and it throws an initial charge on there. It puts a charge onto that capacitor instantaneously, stuffs energy into the system. And then the input backs away. And what do I have? I have a charge on that capacitor, right? With no input, zero input. So that charge on the capacitor just sees a resistor out there to ground. So it's going to start bleeding off that charge. And you know how a capacitor discharges through um, a, a resistor. It had no charge before the delta was hit. The delta hit, it came in and it charged that capacitor up and was able to do so instantaneously because of that unique nature of the delta function. Then the input disappeared and we had that capacitor, you know, holding that charge, but uh, seeing a resistor so that capacitor should discharge something like that. So we have an idea of what the impulse response should look like. It should look like a decaying exponential. And frankly, that should be something that makes you happy. Why? Because when we looked at the unit impulse response before, we know it depended on the natural modes of the system. And when we were looking at differential equations, we knew that natural modes always were exponential in form. So the fact that I get something looking exponential here is very consistent with what we expect or understand from linear time invariant systems described by constant and coefficient linear differential equations. These constant coefficient linear differential equations, when, when given energy inside, respond with exponentials. We saw that in the, in the first lecture for this second chapter. The way systems want to release energy naturally, right? Their, their natural response is these natural modes, right? Which are always exponential in form. The unit impulse response depends on those natural modes, and so it also is going to have exponential forms in it. So we have done really no math here. We've just used our intuition about circuits. Uh, we have an idea of what the step response should look like. You know, you throw a voltage onto a circuit, it should charge up to that voltage. We also have an idea of what the unit impulse response to the circuit should look like. The delta function stuffs charge immediately onto the capacitor, then backs off and that capacitor should uh, discharge through the resistor in an exponentially decaying way. We're going to go back down now and make sure that all the math on this works. We're going to start by finding the unit impulse response, and we'll see if it matches our intuition. And then we're going to take that unit impulse response, and we're going to use that through the convolution integral to determine the step response, the output of the system in response to a, to a unit step input. Okay. For us to find the unit impulse response, little h of t, we need the differential equation model of this circuit. The first thing I'm going to note is I'm going to note that there is some ideal capacitor um, equations, right? The ideal of capacitor equation tells us how current and voltage are related uh, for a capacitor. The current through a capacitor, I of t, right, is equal to the capacitance times the time derivative of the voltage, which on this particular circuit was just y. So if we go back to our circuit, we had a current I of t through the capacitor, right? And then the voltage across that capacitor, we just happen to call our output variable y of t. So ideal capacitor equation says I of t equals c dv dt, right, um, of that capacitor. So, and the voltage here is y, so y dot. The second thing that we can do on here, this would not be enough, right? That's not enough to get a, a, a differential equation description for the system because I don't see an x anywhere, right? It does have a y, but it doesn't have an x. It has that variable i. Um, that's not enough for us. We need to get something with just x's and y's. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do Kirchhoff's um, voltage law, so KVL. KVL is just adding up all the voltages in the loop um, um, of this circuit, and we know that they all have to be some equaling to zero. So if I go back up there and look, I'm going to start out with a voltage x of t, right? That's going to be equal to the voltage drop across those two components. The first one is a resistive drop, so it's going to be i times r, and the second one was already labeled. It's just y of t. So if I come back here at KBL, I end up getting something like an x of t, right, is being equal to i of t times r plus y of t. So that's the, the Kirchhoff's 
current or voltage law, the loop equations for this circuit. What I can notice here is that that has x's and y, but it also has an i. But fortunately, right, I had an expression for i, right, and I should be able to take that guy and plug it into there. That's going to get rid of the i and put it, put it into a, a differential equation form that only has x's and y's, which is what I really need. So I'm going to just do a little basic substitution here, and I'm going to get x of t, right, being equal to, what is i? It's just cy dot. Multiply that by r, so I'm going to get an r c y dot of t plus y of t. This is looking a lot more promising. It only has output and input and their derivatives all in a single equation. Um, it's not quite in standard form, so let's go ahead and work at putting this into operator form. Um, our standard operator form puts the output variable on the left, right? So let's get the y's off on the left and put the input onto the right. And I could maybe do it something like this, d r c plus one, right? acting on y of t being equal to 1 acting on x of t. Okay, if I didn't do anything else and I went forward, um, you would probably make some progress, but you would also likely probably have a, a mistake. And why is that? It's because, again, we have not quite gotten this into standard form. If I take a look at the coefficient, right, for that d term, that highest order derivative on the output side, we see that right now we have a coefficient rc. And we had said that standard form really requires us to have that rc or that value, that coefficient for that highest order derivative term. Um, it has to be 1. Since this guy is not in that form, right, I need to get it into that form by dividing the entire equation by RC. Think about what would happen if I did not do that. If I left it like that, I might sit there and think PD was equal to 1. And remember what we need PD for. If we go back up a bit, right, and we think about finding H of T, H of T requires us to know PD, right? It's going to operate on that Y tilde. Um, ZIR in order to find that unit impulse response. If I don't do that normalization, I would use a PD here 1 when really it needs to be 1 over RC. I'd be off by a scale factor. So keeping to standard forms is super important. Um, those standard forms are expected for all those other equations that were derived. So we're not quite there yet. We're not quite into standard form. So we need to get over here to standard form. Standard form, right, needs that nth order derivative of y coefficient, which we called a0, needs to be equal to 1. We can do that by multiplying the entire equation by 1 over rc. What does that give us? That gives us d plus 1 over rc acting on y of t equals 1 over rc acting on x of t. These two equations are exactly the same thing. They describe the exact same input-output behavior. It's just one is in standard form for which we um, need in order for all the other equations that we derived to be correct. So this is the equation that I want. This is my constant coefficient linear differential equation description of this circuit um, expressed in standard form. A quick check, a quick mental check on this. The thing I'm going to notice here is that it's first order, right? First order system, right? There's only a single derivative term in here. If I go back to the circuit and take a look at this guy, I only see, right, one energy storage element, that capacitor, because there's only one storage element in the circuit, I expect a first order system. So the fact that I got a differential equation that had a single derivative um, corresponding to the one energy storage element makes me happy. That's a quick mental check to know that I'm, that I'm at least on the right track of things. Okay, so I've got a differential equation description. And just a reminder of notation now. Um, this guy that's acting on y of t is my q of d, right? This guy here acting on my input is just my p of d. So I have a constant coefficient linear differential equation expressed in standard form. And I'm going to use that now to find the unit impulse response of my, of my system, which I already knew intuitively should be a decaying exponential. Let's go ahead and remind ourselves what that unit impulse response looks like. That unit impulse response looks like an h of t being equal to v0 delta t, right? And then we're going to have what? We're going to have a plus, and we're going to have p d acting on y tilde z i r of t, and I'm going to have a u of t in here. If I look at that p d, right, 
The QD is a first order system. So the D there has the coefficient A0. That one over RC on the left hand side is the A1, right? So there is a coefficient A0 equaling one there. And this is my coefficient A1. If I look at my PD, there is no D, it's a zero D. That zero is my B zero. And this one over RC is my B one. So you just have to be a little bit careful here. You need to make sure you understand the notation and the subscripting on these coefficients. In this particular case, we find out that the order of derivative on the on the input variable side does not match the order of the derivative on the output side. And since the highest order derivative of the input does not match the highest order derivative of the output, we're not going to have that B0 term. That means there's no delta function on this guy. There's no way that this thing acts like a, just like a, a plain wire type of component. So B0 here is zero. We have no delta term in this particular case. The next thing that I'm going to need is I'm going to need to find that y tilde zir of t. It's a first order system. It should be comprised of a single mode. What do I need? I need to know what the characteristic root is. I get that characteristic root by looking at q, replace d with lambda. So I'm going to look at q of lambda. In this particular case, q, we can get it right off the differential equation. So I'm going to get lambda plus 1 over rc. That's the characteristic polynomial. Set it equal to 0. That's the characteristic equation. Solve that for lambda, and I get lambda equaling minus 1 over rc. That is the characteristic root, right? Now I can do that, and I can find that the characteristic mode, right, has some form c e to the lambda t, which in this case, maybe I should not call that c. I don't want to confuse that with, with the capacitor. So maybe I'll just call that k, something like that, k e to the lambda t. So I'm going to get here a k e to the minus t by rc. That's what my characteristic mode looks like, right? I need to find that coefficient k. That coefficient k I'm going to find, find with my special, right? And why do I use special initial conditions? Because this is a very special case. It's the case of finding um, the yzir for the very specific case of finding the unit impulse response h of t. Again, the, the, the derivation is not terribly intuitive, but it is in the book if you want. So we're going to find this with the special initial conditions that we talked about before. What were the special initial conditions? They were all the lower order derivatives um, initial conditions were equal to zero, and then the highest order one uh, was equal to one. Because this is a first order system, there's only one initial condition. And so the highest order one is going to be the only initial condition. And we're going to set that equal to one. So in this particular case, it's going to be y tilde zir. No derivatives here needed. It's just the function itself. And it's set equal to one. It's the only initial condition that's needed. So set that one equal to one. If I do that, what do I know? I know that my y tilde zir of t, right, was just that linear combination of characteristic modes. But here there's only one mode, so there's just going to be one term in there. And we know that evaluated at t equaling 0 through that special initial condition, that whole thing should be equal to 1. If I look at that left-hand side, k e to the 0, e to the 0 is just 1, so I'm going to get k equaling 1, right? So if I solve that whole thing, right, I just get k equaling 1, and that tells me that my y tilde zir of t is equal to, in this case, e to the minus t by rc. Now we're going to head back to our, our expression for the unit impulse response. We already know that this particular system did not have a delta function. We just found this guy. We just found the y tilde zir. We know how to multiply something by unit step. All we now have to do is we just have to take that PD, operate it on that y tilde, and then go ahead and get our final expression for h of t. What is my PD? It is just from before. We saw that as being 1 over rc. So if I come back here and I do this guy, and I think about what is my h of t, h of t is equal to 0. I'm going to put in some terms just to remember that they were there. So a 0 delta t plus what is pd? pd was 1 over rc. What is y tilde zir? That is an e to the minus t by rc, right? All made causal u of t. Clean that up just a little bit, make it look um, just a little bit more pretty. I get h of t equals, I'm going to have here a 1 over rc, e to the minus t by rc, u of t. Let's go ahead and plot that out and see what it looks like. B0 
because of the U of T, right? Because of the U of T on here, this thing is zero before zero. At T equaling zero, that unit step turns on, right? And so then we're going to get just a one over RC, E to the minus T over RC. Put T equaling zero in there. I'm going to get E to the zero is just one times one over RC. So this thing peaks out initially at one over RC. That's its initial height. And then we know what an E to the minus T divided by RC does because R and C are both positive quantities. Um, that E to the minus T over RC when T is positive is going to be a decaying or a negative exponential that keeps on getting smaller and smaller with time. So that guy is going to go, right, as e to the minus t by rc with a 1 over rc out front. It's a decaying exponential. Remember, this whole thing is my h of t as a function of t. And if you remember what we hypothesized that guy was going to look like, we had an idea that it was going to be that decaying exponential. We knew that just from our circuit knowledge. So we have some pretty good confirmation that this process that we went through, right, that this process that we went through makes sense and is likely the correct thing. Now, what do I also have? I also have, in this particular case, a, a input that I'm worried about. Um, that input we could also take a look at. So this is my x of t equaling the unit step as a function of time. Go ahead and look at that guy. We know that that guy, right, has some pretty straightforward look um, as a function of time. It's just that that single um, uh, voltage coming on for, for all non-negative time. So it's a, it's a light switch kind of function. We now want to find out uh, what is the output. What is y of t, right, equaling h, the system h, acting on my input x of t, which we said was this unit step. We're trying to find the step response. We want that guy. We know because it's a linear time invariant system described by a constant coefficient linear differential equation that we can get that as an integral minus infinity to infinity of x of tau, and I'm going to have an h of t minus tau d tau. We can do this through the convolution integral. Um, we haven't introduced this yet, but I'm going to go ahead and give it for the first time. We can also do a shorthand notation of this. We could call this x of t, and I'm going to use an asterisk in here. In this class, we'll read that asterisk not as multiplication, but as convolution, um, and then h of t. So um, that's just a shorthand notation for that integral, which is really the mathematical thing that we're talking about here. The input convolved with the unit impulse response. We want to be able to um, go ahead and evaluate that. So we need, we need, right, we need to evaluate, evaluate this convolution. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to recommend, okay, so a recommend, uh, we'll recommend a three-step kind of a three-step procedure. It's a weird three-step procedure, um, but once you get the hang of it, it will make some sense. I'm going to write out the procedure or what is the procedure first, um, and then we are going to go ahead and we are going to use the procedure with this particular example to find the output. When I first write the procedure, it's going to seem a little odd. It will take some practice for this procedure to really gel, to really make some sense uh, to where you can use it in a, in a smart way. So what's the three-step procedure? The first thing that we're going to want to do, we're going to want to go ahead and graph the arguments of the convolution integral. So those things inside the integral. So we're going to want to graph x of tau and that function h of t minus tau as functions of tau. Okay, So we're going to want to graph x of tau and h of t minus tau as functions of tau. The second step in here is going to start with a large negative, that's a large negative um, value of t. So you might think minus infinity is pretty large and negative, right? And look at the product. x of tau h of t minus tau, that's going to have some particular form or shape, okay? And we are going to eval, so and, evaluate, evaluate the integral of that product, x of tau h of t minus tau for 
a region, and we will need some practice to understand what we mean by region. Um, for a region where that's where the integral has a set form. Okay, so that region also, by the way, so when I talk region here, that's an interval, it's an interval of time. So we're looking for an interval of time where that integral has a set form, and we hope that we can evaluate that integral in one step for all the values of time on that region, on that interval of time. Third step then, uh, which actually can become multiple steps, is we're going to repeat. We're going to repeat step two for all regions, all regions, right, for all regions until, you know, you get to get to t getting to infinity until you cover all times that could be possibly interested in. So this is the three-step process. You graph the arguments of the integral, right? x of tau and h of t minus tau as functions of tau. Um, then, starting with a large negative value of t, you look at that product and you evaluate that integral where it has a set form, what we call a region, for wherever it has that set form, um, that region, that interval of time. And then you repeat that for all possible regions. Okay, Like I said, uh, this is a process that I think is uh, probably best demonstrated by example or multiple examples. And as we do more examples, you'll become more comfortable. Probably initially, you're going to have a confusion as to what the heck it means. And if as you go through it, you will eventually develop a mental image or a mental model for this. It will click, and then you'll find out that it's really no big deal, that it's something that uh, can be done uh, really straightforwardly. So let's go back to our circuit example. Back to our circuit example, right? We had an x of t equaling u of t. And we know what that basically looked like, right? We had an h of t equaling 1 over rc e to the minus t by rc. And we knew what that looked like, right? That looks something like this, OK? And now we would like to go ahead and find, right? We would like to find y of t, the output, in response to this system, which has a unit impulse response, h of t looking like a decaying exponential, um, in response to an input that looks like a unit step. And we know that that comes out of this convolution integral, integral from minus infinity to infinity of x of tau h of t minus tau d tau, something like that. So what is step one? For right now, um, I'm going to just do a little assumption for simplicity. So for simplicity, let's let that RC time constant be equal to 1. Um, that's going to tell us what? That's going to tell us h of t now is going to be 1 over 1. That's just 1. And it's going to be e to the minus t over 1. So that's just going to be an e to the minus t. And I forgot my u of t on the other one. I better clued that up there. That was important. It didn't turn on until 0. So it's going to be an h of t equals e to the minus t u of t. Um, I just don't want to drag this rc around. That's just a distraction for the process that we're going to be talking about on this. So step one. Let's go ahead and think of step one. We want to plot, right, x of tau. This is one of the arguments of the integral. And, right, h of t minus tau as functions of tau. OK, well, I think the first one is pretty straightforward. We know what x was. x was just the unit step. Um, I'm doing it not x of t now. I'm doing it x of tau. So I just replace t with tau. And so I'm going to be looking at x of tau equaling u of tau. And I want to plot this as a function of tau. This is no different than what we've already seen, right? We already know this. If you could plot x of t, you can plot x of tau. It just means what? Instead of putting a t on the horizontal axis, you put a tau on the horizontal axis, because we're plotting as a function of tau. And we're looking at x of tau. And what that guy looks like is exactly the same as we had before, right? It is just this unit step function. It's something that turns on at 1, turns on to a value of 1, starting at tau equaling 0 and going forward to the right. Okay. 
So that wasn't too bad. That was pretty easy. The second one um, is a little more tricky. So we take a look at that. We're looking at plotting h of t minus tau. We need to be able to plot that. What I would like to notice on that is that we have seen these type of operations before, right? We've seen operations on the independent variable. Now, we're not looking at this as a function of t. We're looking at this as a function of tau. So we're looking at this guy as a function of tau. I see that minus sign going on in there. So there's a reflection going on, right? Reflection. And then we also see that extra parameter out there. There is a shift, okay? So h of t minus tau as a function of tau is a reflected and shifted version of h, right? h by itself look like that decaying exponential. If I reflect it, right, reflect it, it's going to look like this, a backwards going exponential. And then if I shift it, right, if I shift this guy, I should get something maybe like that, okay? The thing that's going to help me best understand this then is I've got to figure out where that edge is. If we go back and look at my original h, right, we see that h of 0, right, when the argument is 0, is that edge, right, that edge. h is a function, and if I do reflection and shifting, it doesn't change that function. So we know that that edge, right, occurs when the argument, when the argument of h, right, equals 0, when the argument of h when the argument of h, when the argument of h is zero, something along those lines. Well, what is the argument of h here? The argument of h is t minus tau. So when t minus tau equals zero, I get that edge, right? Solve this for tau because if you remember, we were doing a plot here as a function of tau. We were plotting everything as a function of tau. So solve this guy for tau, and what do you get? You get tau equaling t. So that edge occurs at a value of t, our, our independent variable of our result. Okay, I'm getting pretty ready to do this then. So I'm still trying to look at h of t minus tau. I get that by reflecting, and then I'm shifting by t. So I'm going to have my regular axis here. I'm looking at this as a function of tau. I knew that in this particular case, right, that we had a, a impulse response that was a causal signal. When I reflect it, it's going to be going the other direction, anti-causal, something like that. And when I shift it, I change that edge location, which in this particular case is going to be dictated or indicated by t. All right, so now I'm going to go back and replot these two guys out just very quickly. Um, my first step said we want to go ahead and plot out x of tau as a function of tau. And let me actually do this just a little bit different. Um, this might be helpful in a later step. So I'm going to go ahead and make it on a bigger axis, right? I'm going to do something like this. And we are looking at x of tau as a function of tau. And we know that this guy looks like, right, this unit step, something like that. And then what do I know about my, my, my other function, h of t minus tau? Also, as a, and I might do this actually over a little bit smaller one, and you'll see why here in a minute. So I'm going to go ahead and take something like this, and this is a function of tau, right? Got it. And then we know that this guy was a left pointing guy, something like this, where this edge occurs at tau equaling t, something like that. Okay, so if I went ahead and labeled this guy, this is my x of t minus tau. Now, if I'm going to, not x, this is h, h of t minus tau. Now, if I was going to be completely accurate here, I probably want to know what the parameterization of that curve is under this um, modified argument now, t minus tau. We can easily get that. If you go back to our original where we had an h of t, right, um, here it is. We are looking at h of t minus tau. How do we get that? You just replace t with t minus tau. And at least for the area where it's non-zero, you only have to worry about this 1 over rc, e to the minus, whatever the argument was, in this case, t minus tau, rc. So if I go back, I can plug that into this as well. I know that 
because my RC was equal to 1. This is going to be e to the minus, and I'm going to have the quantity t minus tau. I could clean that up just a little bit, and I could call that e, right, to the tau minus t. Now, I want you to notice one thing. When tau equals t, I would get e to the 0, and that would just be 1. That would be this peak function, as you would expect. As tau goes off to a minus infinity, that expression, again, this expression right here, e to the tau minus t, as tau goes to minus infinity, you get e to the minus infinity minus some value t. That would be e to the minus infinity. That goes to 0. So we see that guy going off asymptotically to 0. So this does seem to be evaluating as we would have expected. OK, so I'm going to just clean up a tiny bit about that. We don't really need all of that. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it something along those lines. Okay, finished with step one. What is step two? Step two, right, is start at a large negative value time, minus infinity, less than t, less than something. This is going to be my first region, and I would encourage you to use this notation. Use a capital R followed by a number one through however many regions there are. We're going to start out the second step at minus infinity. We'll figure out the other part here in a second. We're going to find some interval of time for which the product of these two functions has a particular form. Let's go back to this plot. We are going to be looking at a bunch of different values of t. I'm going to go ahead and uh, grab this, this graph. And one of the beauties of this iPad is now I can grab a hold of this and I can just move it along, right? So let's move it about there. For that value of t, right, that value of t, as shown right now, is a value of t less than tau equaling 0, right? How do I know that? Because this edge right here, right, is at a value of tau, right, being less than that 0 point. So I'm just moving the one graph relative to the other. I'm shifting by t, but t can take on a bunch of different values. That means my shift can take on a bunch of different values. As I take a look at this guy, so let me re-erase this piece and, and, and re-grab that overall graph again. So if I go back and grab this graph again, this is my h of t minus tau. As I look at different values of t, right, that shift just gets moved to different values. t can be anything. The t could be something big and negative. It could be something big and positive. It just sits there and moves around, move, 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 depending on which value of t I'm interested in. Let's put it on top of one another, actually. Um, we might go ahead and make a copy of this guy. So I'm going to copy that. I'm going to come over here and paste it. And then we're going to get rid of some of this uh, uh, kind of distracting part. And we will um, just deal uh, with that piece maybe like that. So let's go ahead and grab this guy. That is my h of t minus tau, right? I'm now just going to superimpose it. Why? Because I need to take this function, right? I need to take this h of t minus tau, and I need to multiply it by my x of tau. And I need to do it for different values of t. I'm interested in the output of all these different values of t. So let's go ahead and take a value of this guy. I could take it over here. The product of those two guys is going to be what? It's going to be 0, right? Because t is less than 0, and my h function here is non-zero only to the left of t, and my x function, the blue one, is non-zero only to the right of tau equaling 0. There's no overlap where um, one or the other functions is not 0. So the product for this particular t I'm showing is 0 everywhere. It's 0 everywhere there. It's 0 everywhere there. Way out here at minus infinity, it's zero, and it's staying 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 zero, until you hit here when tau is equal to t, or t equaling zero, right? When I hit t equaling zero, now those functions start overlapping. So at least for t less than um, zero, right? The shift of my h of t minus tau is such that the product of those two functions is zero. So I can get that captured in this region. So for the region, minus infinity, less than t, less than 0. In that part, the integral of x of tau, h of t minus tau, going from minus infinity to infinity, the area of the product of those two functions is an integral minus infinity to infinity. But the product of those two functions in those cases is always 0. It has a particular form, and we get out 0 because those guys have no overlap. Nice. So I have just completed half of my result, right, with the evaluation of a single interval, integral, because that integral has a fixed form over that part. Let's grab and think about step three. Step three is 
keep doing this for all the different regions. Turns out this particular problem is relatively simple and it only has one more region. So I'm gonna go region two. Region two will pick up where the last region ended. So zero less than or equal to T less than something, okay? And we're gonna be looking at the integral of the product, the integral of X of tau times H of T minus tau. I'm gonna go back up here again. And just because uh, this iPad allows us to do this, here is my function H of T minus tau. We just handled all the cases when T was less than zero, right? We saw the product of those two functions was zero. Now, when I pull t to the forward part, something like this, what do we find? We see that there is some overlap in these functions. In the tau going from minus, whoops, let's do this in a, let's do this in green maybe. So I'm gonna go ahead and make this into green. I'm gonna think about the product of these functions. I'm looking at x of tau times h of t minus tau. The product of these two functions, because x of tau is zero for tau less than zero, um, any value tau less than zero because of the x function being zero on that is gonna make that product zero. So I'm gonna get zero there for all times less than zero. I'm also gonna get zero for all tau's greater than t because my h function is zero for all of those. The only place where I get it to be non-zero, and what is it? It's gonna be one times my exponential, which was what? It was e to the tau minus t. We already figured out that problem. Um, that uh, parameterization. So the product of those two functions on that interval is going to be um, where x was non-zero, it was a value of one, and where h of t minus tau was non-zero, and it was parameterized as e to the tau minus t. And where does that occur from? It occurs from zero to t. So now I'm ready for the second part. Um, for this second part, I know that I'm looking for output y of t. It's the integral minus infinity to infinity x of tau h of t minus tau, d tau, but that product is non-zero only going from tau equaling zero to t, and on that interval, x is one, and h is e to the minus tau minus t, and I need to do this d tau, right? And actually, if I go back to this, it has that same form. It has that form where it's gonna be non-zero from an interval, even though the interval gets wider. The interval is always from zero to t, um, as long as t goes off to infinity, okay? There's only gonna be two regions in this particular waveform. Uh, we might pick up more on this uh, during the recitation. So region two is gonna go from zero less than t less than infinity. And in that region, the only part that we can get any area, right, is where those two functions were each non-zero, which was only on the interval zero to t. Now I've got a simple calculus problem and I'm gonna go ahead and do it. What do I get in this? I could break that exponential and I did a little mistake in here. This should have been um, not an e to the minus tau. It should have been e to the tau minus t, uh, the parameterization of that, of that other uh, function h of t minus tau, which we'd computed out before. So e to the tau minus t in there. If we go ahead and we do this, I can do this as an integral zero to t of e to the tau, e to the minus t, d tau. Pull out the e to the minus t, and I have an integral of e to the tau, which is just e to the tau, and it's gonna be evaluated on the limits, zero to t. If I continue on that, I get e to the minus t, and I'm gonna get e to the t minus e to the zero, right? And if I go ahead and multiply those guys out, like bases, the, the exponents add, so I'm gonna get e to the minus t plus t, that's just gonna be e to the zero minus e to the minus t plus zero is just e to the minus t, which ends up giving me one minus e to the minus t. All right, I basically finished things out. I have an expression for y of t, for region two, right? This is part of what y of t is for region two. I also had up here what the output this was, y of t, that was for region one. And now I'd like to pull them all together into a single expression and we will uh, be done. So what is y of t equal? It is equal to a piecewise function. It is zero for region one, which was t less than zero. And it was one minus e to the minus t for region two, t greater than or equal to zero. Later problems we'll see you can have many more regions. This just turns out to be a pretty, a pretty um, a simple case. It doesn't seem simple first time through. I know that they will seem more simple as we go along. If I go ahead and plot this guy, what do I get? 
I hope that I get something that confirms what I've seen before. It was zero for time, right? Less than or equal to zero. I'm making a plot of y of t. And then if I look at what happens when t is greater than or equal to zero, put in t equaling zero into that expression, one minus e to the minus t. Um, e to the zero is just one, right? So one minus one is zero. And then as I think about t getting bigger, put t equals infinity in there. e to the minus infinity is just zero, so I'll get one minus zero. So this thing is asymptotically going to be working to a value of one, and it's going to approach it in an exponential way. This, right, looks exactly like what we had seen before. It was our expected result. We got it in completely um, through mathematics and in a very precise form. I think this is enough for our first um, our first foray into into convolution. We're going to do a bunch more examples um, uh, in the upcoming recitations.